LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Listen without limits. Unchain your brain. Change your thinking. Change your life. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host, Greg Moffat, and my guest today is Doug Matsky, who joins us to discuss his book, Deep Reality, Why Source Science May Be the Key to Understanding Human Potential. The mainstream view of reality is based on time and space being fundamental. Past, present, and future lie on a linear axis, while our five senses interpret events occurring within a three-dimensional world. For well over a century, quantum physics has been painting a very different picture of reality, but still we continue to cling to a very limited and incomplete model. The current research in artificial intelligence and transhumanism on which so many hang their hopes for our future simply misunderstands the nature of consciousness. Should we truly wish to advance as a species, we must fully integrate the insights of the quantum realm and cutting-edge consciousness research into our view of life the cosmos, and potential meaning and purpose in existence itself. If we open ourselves to the possibility that mind, not matter, is fundamental, then many of the mysteries which science either denies or ignores can be woven into a richer and much more colourful tapestry of life. Dreams, psychic phenomena, and the paranormal and supernatural events which form part of human experience can finally be integrated into individual and collective consciousness in a meaningful way. This more expansive and holistic understanding of reality can help us unlock our true potential. Hello and welcome, Doug, and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me to talk about these ideas. Okay, today, Doug, we're going to talk about your book, uh, Deep Reality, Why Source Science May Be the Key to Understanding Human Potential. That's co-authored with William Tiller. Uh, before we dive into that, just for listeners who don't know, tell us a little bit about your background and your work in general. Yeah, I'm I'm a computer engineer um, and software developer, and so I'm into information theory and you know and programs and and so I've been writing programs my whole life. But I got interested in quantum computing uh, 25 years ago. Uh, hosted uh, two workshops on quantum information, you know, essentially computing, uh, physics and computing, essentially. And and then got interested in working on a PhD in quantum computing in the late 1990s, and um, and so I have a PhD in quantum computing, and I the reason I did that is because I was interested in consciousness and the mind and how the mind was a computer, and I thought well quantum computing is more powerful than classical computers, and so maybe that's how we're intelligent. So so that's sort of my background, and and uh, and then so I says well why don't I turn these ideas into a book and met um, William Tiller and we kind of hit it off and we said, well, let's write it together. So that was six years ago. So if someone asked me, you know, I've been talking about your book and say, well, what's it about? I've read the title. Probably where I would start, which is where I begin with a lot of conversations I have with people who perhaps don't know a lot about these, these subject areas. I say, mm-hmm. well, let's start with the idea that time and space are not fundamental. Because for many people, they're, if they think about it at all, that's the basis of their kind of cosmology, their worldview. You know, time and space are fundamental. These are the, this is kind of scaffolding the framework on which reality is, is constructed, is hung. And I say, well, let's get past that idea. So that, that's a starting point that, uh, they say that I often go to. So, uh, maybe you could take us into, uh, if someone said to you, oh, how come, do you, what do you mean time and space are not fundamental? You know, just your right. response to that. Yeah, absolutely. The, the the key thing about 
uh, time and space is that that's class is generally what's called the classical worldview, right? That that Newton had this perspective that space and time is the stage that all the physics works in. And of course, relativity changed that where they shot, hmm, that stage is kind of warp warpable, right? So relativity changed it. And then we start looking at quantum mechanics, you realize there's this non-locality that's coming due to quantum quantum computing and quantum non-locality um, in EBITs, entangle, entanglement, what they refer to as entanglement. And so it kind of even warps it even further. And so, unfortunately, a lot of the people who are working in quantum computing right now still have this sort of perspective that, oh, it's in space-time. But that doesn't explain entanglement, <laughs> and it doesn't explain a lot of the behaviors that we're seeing that humans can have where they seem to violate you know, non-locality and, and non, non-locality in space and non-locality in time. So part of the purpose of the book is to sort of, sort, of, sort of give an infrastructure, a mathematical infrastructure that says, how is that possible? And in one word, it's hyperdimensional space-time. Essentially, that quantum mechanics requires there to be a hyperdimensional space. Otherwise, you couldn't do quantum computing and entanglement. And once you start, once you realize oh, that's the basis of quantum computing and, in fact, the universe. Um, then all of a sudden you realize, oh, okay, let's start from there and go from that. You use the word hyperdimensional, and that crops up a lot in the book. Uh, so just just, clarif- yeah. just clarify that term, because if we're using it, we, won't, we don't want people to still be asking themselves yeah. what it means. Yeah. Well, there's there's this famous um, book out there called Flat World, and then there's a bunch of videos out there, too, about Flat World um, on YouTube. Um, but essentially, imagine that the universe, that, that our world was only two-dimensional, right? It was it was north and south and east and west, but there was no up and down. It's like a plane. So so all you could do is move in direction that direction, and all the little people in there would be like little circles. Um, and um, and it, all the physics is sort of dependent, like, like you can't have a mouth and then a place, other place where all, all the waste goes out because you would kind of split yourself in two, right? So there's this, there's this dimensionality has an effect on the kinds of organisms and physics that you can have. So we have our normal three-dimensional space. So that's what we think is north, south, east, and west, up and down, right? Well, quantum mechanics has fourth and more dimensions. Each qubit or each e-bit, excuse me, has four dimensions to it and we can't even most people can't even visualize what that means except in mathematics um in to to do this and that's what the spooky action at a distance comes from is this hyperdimensional nature of quantum mechanics because every little qubit and ebit quantum bits and entangled bits that's what those are um have their own private dimensions and if they didn't they wouldn't work the way they do so, so as you start accumulating all those dimensions, you realize, oh, the universe has really got a bunch of dimensions, small little tiny ones. That's a different philosophy than the way string theorists talk about it. They talk about them as little loops and little strings. But these, I think, the little dimensions are actually bits. And now that ties information theory with entropy and, and quantum computing. And it ties information with physics. And physics is already doing that, so... Well, I can see why people struggle with the concept of there being four or more dimensions because we're in this three-dimensional reality, Absolutely. you know, the one that we experience with our five senses. And so, if we think of a, you know, a fourth dimension or a fifth dimension, we we, we think of it within within the three D space, which I right, guess right. I, I guess is you know why we just you know it's, it's a sort of a thought stopper, isn't it? You just where is yeah. it, what what direction does this fourth, fourth dimension go in? I think that's or just yeah. so conditioned by the classical worldview. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, there's a bunch of cubist arts art people who are trying to show what that would look like. You know, if you were a four dimensional being looking down at a three dimensional universe, which is the metaphor of we're a three dimensional person looking down at a flat world, what they would see, and they would see both sides of the lady's face, and they would see the inside and outside at the same time. So it's really a mind bend. An artist even tried to figure out how to represent that back in the you know 1900. So, well, you mentioned, or you know, briefly, the sort of non ordinary experiences um, that human beings have. That right. you know that place that take place if not outside space time then certainly in ways that that warp it 
and, and to have experiences that we would not consider possible or certainly normal in a normal waking experience, you know, so whether this is in dreams, uh, but often mm -hmm. in more extreme situations, uh, near death experiences, out of body experiences, uh, these right. are things that are, you know, more common than people think. And right. they, you know, they, they appear to present this uh, reality is much more malleable and much, much wider than the 3D uh, space time that we you know that we're, we're used to considering to be the ground of everything you know, to being fundamental right uh, but all of that is generally in the classical worldview of course it, it can't be accounted for there's no room for that so therefore rather right. than, rather than try to accommodate those experiences within a, a, a you know a worldview they're just simply excluded it seems to me rather strange and i know there's a lot of very good research and people look dean raiden for example um, yep. gave a, a nice uh, review of your of your books it, you know, people like him yep. are are doing you know um hard scientific work on this in in trying to account for these experiences and expand physics to to accommodate those because they're real enough mm -hmm. but i think again when most people approach this it's that no matter what the subjective experience of an individual is it's always going to be trumped by objective reality as that can, which can be quantified and measured in a classical way. Correct. Right. The, just remember, you say objective, but really it's our model of the objective universe that they're clinging to. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. There's a lot of experiments that show they're non-local too, so it's just our model that they're clinging to. So. Oh, yeah, and I realize this. I mean, this is another thing that a lot of our, th our thinking is governed by language you know we think in terms of language so that's very lim can be very limiting and we use right. words like subjective and objective at sometimes erroneously or without scientists will sometimes say that this is objective these are objective results um, but I did an interview with Rupert Sheldrake and he was at pains to point out and his entire life's work really highlights the fact that scientists are you know classical scientists are human beings too and the idea yeah. that that any experiment involving a human being or human beings can be entirely objective doesn't really hold. So I think, again, that comes back to questioning uh, fundamentals. You know, what, what is subjective and objective experience? What is that really? Yeah, really. Um, people have been banning these terms about objective and subjective reality around for a long time. So I'm trying to put more concrete ways of talking about it, right? And so one of the things I talk about it is this notion of a model, right? Well, a model is is our we interpret what we're looking at because we have a model of what we're looking at, right? You can't really look at it like a baby. You can't really look at what's going on because you have no context to put it in, right? So our models influence so much of what we see and what we do, and that's the particle wave duality that we see in quantum mechanics. If you're looking at it like a particle would, you know, then you would see particle behaviors. If you're looking at the way a wave would, how you, so it's your model that determines how you measure, how you observe, and how you measure, right? So, so those two ideas are tied to meaning because the model is not really objective in a sense. It's not concrete. You can't put it in a wheelbarrow. You can't carry it across the room. It's in our head. Well, what is that model? That model is our, is our abstract meaning of all of these relationships about how we're trying to view the world, right? So meaning is an important ingredient that most people don't talk about. And in fact, physics has no way of talking about meaning whatsoever. Uh, only computer scientists do that. And you can say, well, I have all this energy in this battery, but that doesn't is different than the kind of all the bits in a computer which might have meaning in them where just the energy in the battery doesn't have any meaning except for its energy capacity so so distinguishing between the models of not only space and time but also information versus energy is a big important step to get out of this four-dimensional mindset which usually coincides with energy mindset, right? So I'm trying to look at all this with the perspective of information and talking about it as meaning, as an important attribute of how, how we do science even, right? Because how we do our models is having to do with our meaning of how we're looking at the universe, how we're running our experiments. So hopefully that was clear about what I'm talking about there. So. Well, what you're saying, it reminds us again that 
the, the subjective element. That I, I'll, I'll use those terms subjective, objective. Let's just say yeah. as they're commonly okay. con, commonly known or commonly considered to be understood uh, rather than trying to redefine them at this stage. That might no, be I, which I'm not doing either. I'm just talking, trying to talk about them in more concrete terms. Oh, I agree. And that's another thing that I, I find that even with a, lo- a lot of scientists, there can be a degree of, of woolly thinking about certain things. And again, Absolutely. it's back to what I was saying about language. You know, you're, you, right. you're banding these terms around, but when you start to drill down into it, it kind of starts to fall apart a little bit, and it's not quite as rigorous and thorough as it first appeared to be. Well, you right. know, what, what do you mean by term X? What do you mean by term Y? And it's like, Absolutely. well, I, you know, everybody knows what I mean. No, we don't know that. So <laughs> <laughs> right. Absolutely right. <laughs> There's a lot of that. but And you see this in a lot of um, – I'm not a scientist. I don't have a science background. Uh, but I do take great interest in popular science, you know, the science that reaches the interested portion of the pop- general population that wants to know about these things. And certainly there's been a lot written about quantum physics in, in popular mm-hmm. science books and journals and websites and what have you. But I'm reminded here again about, uh, and again, you alluded to this in terms of, let's just say, scientific experiments or research what those mm-hmm. conducting it are expecting to see based on, for example, a model uh, or mm-hmm. expecting to see based on past history. But that's not an unreasonable approach to take. You know, what have we previously seen when we've been doing this might well indicate what we might see going forward, but also perhaps what they want to see. And mm-hmm. I have done a, a several interviews where we got into the work that was taking place at, at CERN um, mm-hmm. in Switzerland, you know, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, and particularly around the Higgs boson. Did Did that somehow... Register did it manifest because the scientists working on it, you know, the, this theoretical particle that they somehow willed it into existence. So that might sound fanciful to some people, but I think that what you're expecting to see based on your previous experience, your previous prejudices, whatever you want to call them, mm-hmm. and what you want to see, you know, what, what, what is your desired outcome of, uh, of, of scientific experiment? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the same thing that other physicists have talked about, but also people who are working in metaphysics, because if you take um, some experiments that are metaphysical oriented and you have a disbeliever running the experiment, um, no phenomena shows up. But yet you know that from the, you know, from the placebo effect, that just ob- observing a system can have an effect on it. So, so you know, how, how, and you know, Dean Radin's work also supports that, right? Because he did his double slit experiment, which was in a shielded box, automated shielded box for a double slit experiment, and he put it on the web and people could influence it directly. So it's kind of like a modern quantum version of the PK experiments that they did at the at Princeton, right? And um, and he did a very nice job for it. Some people have said, and I quote, and I agree with them, that says, that is Nobel winning work, you know. And and the fact that it was just like ignored is is an indication of how science really has their blinders on about fundamentally looking at experiments in a novel model of the world and and coming up with these model new new experiments that that show that there's something different there than we had presumed before william tiller did exactly the same thing you know he said oh we have this device that he calls an intention host device that somehow he was able to figure out that you could store intention in it. So now, all of a sudden, you can say, I want the intention. He meditates and puts an intention in this device, and he has a process for doing that. It says, I want the pH of water to go up by one degree, by one, one point, you know, from 7 to 8, or go down from 7 to 6. And then he puts this device with this thought pattern in it um, in the lab and then walks away from it, and the water responds to the intention he put in the device. And that's not that much different than people putting intention in water, like love or healing intention, or even like um, people who are doing heal, hands-on healing, they're putting it using intention. The point is you can store it, and which means now all of a sudden you have meaning and intention and thought that's not in the brain. And so, like, that is a novel idea, and... Um, and that's another example that I'm that I wanted to make sure that the readers heard about or your listeners heard about because um, because 
if you had a classical worldview that the brain is the mind, you wouldn't think of doing that experiment, and you wouldn't think that such a device was even possible. Well, that cuts to another fundamental in all of this, and that's to do with the, you know, the relationship between mind and brain, which for many people are essentially interchangeable. You know, ment mental activity occurs within the brain, so your mind is kind of somehow in inside your skull. Even even despite when you talked about those non non ordinary experiences earlier, you know, evidence. I was going to again won't say you know subjective evidence that uh, the mind extends beyond the body. Uh, which is mm -hmm. there. So perhaps we should say something about that because the, the idea that, yeah, your brain is that, you know, gray lump inside your skull, your mm -hmm. mind is something else entirely. And, and that again cuts to the, one of the fundamentals here about, uh, what the, the ground of reality right. may be. What we're looking at is to say, you know, consciousness being fundamental and, and time and space being within that. Um, again, because this goes back to the idea that I mentioned at the top of the hour, you know, a lot of, for a lot of people, the, the fundamentals are time and space. And so it's very difficult for them to imagine, uh, time and space being within something, you know, which is beyond that. So that's kind of two questions really, which is, you know, but perhaps you could just unpick that in whichever way you, you, you like. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, the, so, you know, I, I like to think about this as quantum brain which assumes the brain is fundamental and somehow quant consciousness and, and thinking is emergent from that, right? Versus quantum mind, which says that the mind is kind of independent of the brain and it somehow can affect the physical world. And the fact that these experiments show that the mind can affect the physical world, essentially Descartes' assumption was wrong, that, you know, the, the physics is all, you know, science is all about the things, you know, there's religion and then there's science and they don't interact. Well, the fact that, that all of a sudden Descartes' assumption was shown to be wrong, which the mind can affect the physical world, once you can talk about that, then you can say, well, then not only can it affect this water or this quantum device or this PK experiments, this random event generator, um, but it can also affect um, the brain itself. Think about it as, uh, as, a, an, as a quantum version of a transceiver, an antenna, and a transceiver that we are so linked with, we just can't imagine that we're anything else than our brain. But where does all that insight, that meaning, that consciousness, that when you look at the world outside, how do you see stuff that looks real, but people have that same reality that they have, they can view that same reality in a, in a lucid dream, and they can't distinguish which one is more real, the lucid dream, or the image that's, quote, coming in from their eyes, right? So, you know, this whole, this whole notion of, of inside the brain or outside the brain, it's just that we don't have a decent model up until this point about what, what the mind would be if it wasn't the brain. And so that's why I try to differentiate quantum brain versus quantum mind. And I think quantum mind basically says, well, if the quantum mind is really hyperdimensional, this hyperdimensional states, that means it's independent of the brain. And that matches the kind of behaviors we're actually seeing with the mind. Um, you know, lucid dreaming, out-of-body experiences, telepathy, precognition. It says that, that, that this thing that we would call quantum mind is as fundamental as quantum physics is, and that it's outside the box defined by four-dimensional space-time. And it's informational. And that has all the properties of quantum mechanics. Just for a bit of housekeeping, when you mentioned PK, I think you're talking about yeah. psychokinesis or telekinesis. Absolutely. Yeah. Ju again, just for people who perhaps didn't get that uh, that little abbreviation that you did. Yeah. Uh, and so that that's mind affecting matter. People usually think of it like you know someone with with a psychokinesis abilities, uh, you know, moving objects, for example, uh, that they're not touching that type of thing. But there's more to it than that. But that that's essentially what it is. Yeah. Right, right. Well, the point is, is that anything that, any time that you have physics, you can you can compute what's called the entropy, which all it is is a measure of amount of the disorder in the system, essentially. Um, and, and entropy is always increasing um, in most of physics in a closed system. And we can show that the mind is producing an effect that looks like some kind of more order is being introduced into a closed system. Begs the whole idea again. It's the model, 
it begs the idea, well, is it really a closed system? <laughs> and if you have a hyperdimensional space, you, you can realize, well, it's really not a closed system. I'll give you an example for that. If, if you have a two-dimensional space, you cannot form a knot because you need the third dimension to wrap the string around to pull, pull it through to form a knot. In three dimensions, you can form a knot. But in four dimensions, there's another extra dimension. So if you form a knot, there's a way to unknot it by just pulling it because there's that fourth dimension to escape, escape route. So the point is, is that in the same way that you can't make a knot in a four dimension, you can't really build a sealed room, a three dimensional room, if you have a four dimensional thing that's looking at it. This goes back to the flat world and the model like that. So uh, it's important to realize that these these ideas are again all built on our model and if you start with this notion that oh we're maybe not three-dimensional we're and we're not energy and we're not brain cells and so the getting your head wrapped around thinking outside the box idea means outside the box of 3d space-time and then you need some well what is that thing and the only thing that's out there that falls into that without inventing anything new is the bits that we use to build quantum quantum computing. So that's why I call my theory source science, because it's the source, it's the science of the source of everything in the physical and in the non-physical. So you just used the term model when you were talking again about the ideas uh, in your book. Now, I, I, that's just an artifact of language probably once again, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, we need to be able to communicate until we de develop tel telepathy, we need to be able to communicate verbally, uh, you know, and in other means using language to, to uh, you know, cause you were sort of calling into question the working with models, you know, scientific models, because again, that can guide what you're expecting right. um, as an outcome. So it's, when you use the term model, it's like, well, we have to find some, um, I'm fascinated by language as well as, as, yeah. as quantum yeah. physics. We, we have to find some way of expressing this you know, and you can spend all day calling into question your own use of words. But again, I do think it's good to be rigorous, you know, because I think yeah. there's, there's far too much sloppy speech and, and, and writing when it comes to really important subjects. And yeah. a lot of stuff is, is allowed to, to pass that should really be, uh, it should be really called into question. Because what, what other term could you use for the overall cosmology or worldview or view of reality that your book is presenting you know model i mean that that works as well as anything else i think well yeah i'm just used to being calling it a model is the most generic term but yeah you those other terms you used are perfectly perfectly good and i spend a lot of bit of time in the book kind of pointing out language mistakes also i mean even the use of the word subtle energy um i don't like that term because subtle energy doesn't talk about the informational side of what we see with with subtle energy you know that this notion of healing and intention and you know there is a difference between the intention of having the ph of water go up versus the ph of the water going down well what is that difference well it's kind of a meaning thing you know and yet energetically it might not if you were just looking at it from the amount of energy put in the system you say well is there any difference in the energy probably not but in the intention there is so, so that's why I'm, I, I spend a lot of time talking about, uh, you know, Dr. Tiller coined the term in the 90s, subtle energy. So he coined that term, and he's, you know, a fundamental player in this field for a long time. Um, I personally don't like that term because, um, because it, it sort of takes away, makes people think about it as if we're batteries rather than computers, you know, and... Uh, and even the notion of, of God, they say he's all-powerful and all-knowing, right? I mean, and my belief is that, well, if God was all-knowing, by definition, he would be all-powerful. You know, that you can flip it around and say that the knowing part means that he has control over the, you know, creation, you know, being able to create anything in the universe because he's manipulating the universe. And there's a fundamental relationship between bits and energy and that's called Landauer's principle. And I talk about several examples in the book where even, even having time involved injects order and, time, and bits into something that looks random, but if you put them together so that there's, they're concurrent, 
that concurrency builds bits as well. So this notion of where do bits come from and how can you create more order and how that relates to space and time and energy is all part of the story that it's hard to compress in an hour when there's you know a 350 page book um, talking about that subject. So you use the phrase box of 3D space time, which is I think what we're what you and I are speaking to each other in. It's what we experience yeah. um, mm-hmm. in our day to day lives. Um, most for most people, they only really step outside of that at night when they dream. I always take exception, or at least try to have a conversation when people say to me, um, or, you know, we're talking about dreams, especially if you have a, a dreaming experience that it feels very profound, you know, because some people have dreaming experiences that really affect their lives. Um, Absolutely. Maybe only for a short time, temporarily, but, you know, they, they feel that something has happened to them. And I remember when I was a child, particularly if I had a bad dream, um, the adults would say, it's not real. And that always made me think, well, you know, what was that? experience that I had then because it felt real at the time and mm. if it was right. a, if it was a bad dream and I woke up you know sweating and, and, and upset you know distressed well that's mm. what is that then how, how can you say that is somehow not real of course I know what they meant they mm-hmm, meant was mm-hmm. that the the events the people the places the events whatever occurred you know in in your dreaming state didn't take place in the 3d reality of your waking state in a way that other people could observe it, whatever. But, mm-hmm. and that, that was one of the early things that set me on the course of questioning what reality actually was. Cause I was being told that oh, okay. an, an experience that I had was not real, put that in air quotes. So, and I think that again, although for most people, that's their first indication of something else other than your aforementioned box of 3d space time um, yeah. existing. It also makes way for the, the things we've been talking about, you know, the psi phenomena, telepathy, precognition, clairvoyance, telekinesis, and other anything that come under the uh, umbrella of paranormal, perhaps, or even supernatural near-death experiences, OBE, synchronicity, all of that stuff that has been going on, as far as we can see, is, as long as, you know, humans have been, you know, modern humans like us have been having an experience this is right. all part of it, and sometimes very, very profound part of it. But your model, to use that term again, th- th- makes room for all of this. Suddenly, it all becomes allowable, and you can start to think right. about it in terms of, of you know, I wonder what the mechanism for this is. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, and, you know, it gets back to that hyperdimensional nature. You know, there's, there's, this mo- there's this model, I'll use the term of a model again, is that maybe the universe is a simulation, right? Um, but remember, any simulator that you have to have, if you have a simulator, like let's say you have a flight simulator, and, the, and you're, in, you're in this flight simulator, and you're flying this plane, right? And you, and you look out the window, and it's so real that you can't, and it, and it moves, it, it, it jockeys you around, it has kinetic, kinetic motion, part of the simulation. You almost can't tell that it's a simulation. It looks like a real plane, and they use it for training pilots, right? So it's very real. Okay, but it's still a simulation. And what's and and why can you know it's a simulator? Because the simulator, you can't see. You're inside the simulation, but you can't see the simulation. You can only see the effect of the simulation, which is kind of inside that box, which is the simulator box, right? But you can't see the computer that's running it. That's the whole idea. A good simulator, you can't see the thing underlying it, right? Well, the same thing is true with the physical universe. The physical universe. And you have to have enough computational power, by the way, to do all the flight simulation stuff, including the visual images and all that stuff and, and making it realistic so that you, it doesn't look grainy. All, all of that is very computer intensive. We know how to do all that now, virtual reality. So this notion now we have a model for virtual reality and we say, well, the universe isn't like a virtual reality system, but extremely high fidelity. And we can't see the computer that runs the simulation. Right. So where is it? You know, and that's what I say is the hyperdimensional quantum universe. It's the simulation infrastructure that runs the simulator, which we call our universe. Okay, And it's only because our mind is of the same ilk as that, is that we actually essentially can we're we our mind represents the source 
code like we would if we we're coding the simulator, the source code, and we can actually manipulate the simulation because our mind is of that ability, has that ability to do that. And that's what we do in our dreams. We're essentially manipulating the simulator that runs the universe, and we're creating our own little private virtual universe and virtual simulation. And people who get really good at this have lucid dreams. And people who are really good at this, who are Zen masters and stuff like that, can create a reality that's so real that other people are part of that reality. Okay? And so, and you can see it when you have a near-death experience. There's this whole notion that if you have a near-death experience, you think, oh, it's just the person having the near-death experience. No. People in the room are sucked into that model of the person having, you know, into that experience of the, of the simulation of this virtual of this near death experience and they go along with it too like the zen masters do you know so the point is is that it's a model that that's that can be this experience can be shared because it's like our mind is is part of that infrastructure okay so that's kind of a long story to say the universe is a simulation and our mind is part of the programming of the simulator so we can kind of control whatever we want in the simulator that concludes part one of our interview. Part two will be available soon in the subscribers area at legalizefreedom.com. Legalizefreedom.com.